All right, man, good morning. Welcome back to the Champion Circle. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right, let's do this. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to 1 Samuel. Uh, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel this morning, and uh, we are looking at the life of Samuel. Uh, he is our character this morning that we're going to unpack his life. I hope that we can uh, do the best we can to get through uh, a lot of his uh, personal experience, his ministry, certainly his character. You know, doing these character studies sometimes present uh, a certain challenge because there's absolutely no way that we can be comprehensive uh, when we look at a life. Um, because, I mean, just look at Samuel's life, for example. He's got two books with his name on it. And uh, we'd be here all day, probably tomorrow, if we were to spend time walking through in detail uh, so much of what Samuel did. Now, the books of First and Second Samuel certainly are the storyline of King David's life, uh, but Samuel is a key character in all of that. And so we're going to have to pick and choose. And what I hope to do today is, just in case you don't know who Samuel is, I want to introduce him to you and, and sort of look at the entire arc of his story. Uh, and so we'll look at some of those biographical facts. Uh, but then we're going to look at some key passages. And so I'm going to cherry pick some things that I think really reveal Samuel's character to us as men, particularly the things that I believe we should apply to our life today in the 21st century. Not all of it is transferable, but I believe these things are, and uh, I think it's important that that's how we do these character studies. Now, a lot of times when we do a character study as well, I'll give this disclaimer, we look at a character and we only look at the high points, right? So be this guy in this way, be this guy in this way, but Samuel did have blemishes, Samuel did have problems. Samuel did have shortfalls. In fact, when I apply uh, what we're learning this morning uh, here in a little bit, I'm going to apply it specifically to the home and specifically to parenting and marriage. But if I'm being honest, guys, Samuel missed the mark on that. Samuel was not the best father. And we see that revealed to us in the books of First and Second Samuel. And so a lot of times in Scripture, we have this great character and we do these character studies and we say, be like him. At the same time, we need to recognize that Samuel's not Jesus. And so when we say, be like him, we're not aiming our life to look, smell, and act like Samuel. That's not it. We're to look, act, and love more like Jesus, right? But Samuel is a good example in so many ways of that. And that's why we do these character studies. So that's Jason's disclaimer on the morning, okay? So with that said, I do want to look at some quick facts. So Samuel, let's look at chapter 1, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 1, and that's where we're going to be introduced to this character. Now, as we begin to look at the text, I want to uh, sort of bring you in on an important fact about the Old Testament. There are four offices in the Old Testament that are important to us. Four offices. Uh, we look at prophet, priest, judge, and king. Prophet, priest, judge, and king. So when Samuel is living and when Samuel is ministering, Samuel is filling three of the four offices. Okay? So Samuel acts as prophet. Samuel acts as priest. Samuel acts as judge. Samuel does not act as king. Because up until this point in Old Testament history, there is no king over Israel except for Yahweh. God is the king over Israel. He is the supreme ruler. He is the only king, the king of kings, lord of lords. God is that character. And so the judge, in many respects, is the ruler of the people. He's the leader over the people. He's the under-shepherd underneath the king who has been empowered to stand in front of the people and direct them. We see this in the book of Judges, particularly when the judge is appointed as a military presence in Israel. Oftentimes steps in to save Israel uh, from their enemies. And so that's, that's the idea of judge. Now, Moses is the one that institutes the idea of judge in the Old Testament. His father comes to him and says, hey, you can't do all of this. You need to appoint judges over the people to help rule this unruly people. So that's where we see the first instance of judge. So Samuel is a judge in the Old Testament. He is actually the final judge in the Old Testament. 
And so after Samuel, there are no more judges. That office is vacated and set aside. Now Samuel also acts as priest. And this idea of being a priest, we can think of an individual who's standing in the gap between God and the people of God. Oftentimes a priest would be appointed to intercede for the people. That is to pray for the people. That is to take the people's cares and woes and even celebrations and usher them to God so that God would be aware of them. Now, God is certainly aware of them already being omniscient, right? Knowing all things, but the priest is standing in the gap. The other job for the priest to do is to perform sacred duties. Now, we can see that specifically in 1 Samuel 13, where Samuel is appointed to offer sacrifice for the Israelite army before they go into battle. So that's a key moment in Samuel's life. But most often, Samuel is referred to as a prophet, okay? The prophet Samuel. Now, when we think of prophet, a lot of times the first thing we think about is somebody who can uh, see before what's going to happen. They predict it before it happens. God allows them to see something, and then they tell everybody, hey, here's what's going to happen in a week, in a month, in a year, or even in the end of time. That's what we think of when we think of prophet. This is what is called a foreseeing prophet. They see it before. But Samuel most often acted as a forth-telling prophet. That is, he took the word of God that was delivered to him And he preached it to the people. And so a lot of times a prophet, we can even translate that and define that as preacher. He's a teacher of God's word. He's a proclaimer of God's word. God's word was delivered to him and then therefore he delivered it to the people. So he needed to hear from God in order for him to be faithful in his calling and commission. Now immediately out of the gates there's a great application there, isn't there? That we as men, if we're going to fulfill our calling and commission of God, that is to teach and proclaim and live the word of God in every way, what do we need to know first? We need to know the word. We can't live what we don't know. Ignorance is never an excuse in the scriptures. We have a responsibility to dig into this and know it so that we can live it and we can proclaim it. As men, we're called to be leaders. And we're called to live in this direction. And how do we do this? Well, first of all, I need to know this book. Or I'm not going to be successful in what God has called me to do. So we see these four offices. And this is important. We're going to circle back to this in just a moment. Because I do think that if we look at the life of Samuel without looking at the four offices, we've missed it. Okay? And so, again, 1 Samuel 1, 1, here's where we start to look at the biographical facts. So we meet uh, Samuel's parents in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1. In fact, in verse 1, it says that there was a certain man, and his name was Elkanah. Elkanah. Now, for those of you who are young dads, uh, for those of you that are granddads, for those of you that are uncles, and you have any sway in the naming of children, I think this is a great name. Elkanah, can you just imagine? And you think that, that that young man runs out on a football field? Here comes El- I mean, that's, that's powerful. I suggest these things and nobody likes to take my names. So it is what it is, okay? But we also meet in verse 2, Hannah. And Hannah is Samuel's mom. So Elkanah and Hannah. <coughs> now, the text tells us that Hannah is barren. That is, she cannot have children. For some reason... It doesn't identify why. The scripture is oftentimes not a medical textbook, so we don't know the reason why Hannah is not able to have children, but she's not able to have children. And in typical case, in the Old Testament, when a woman is barren, she is devastated because so much of the value of a woman in the Old Testament is her ability to bear children. So she believes she's worthless. Now, to be fair to Elkanah, he repeatedly tells her, hey, listen, That's not where your value is. He's a good man. It's not all all shaken up into this idea that you can't have kids, therefore I don't love you. Now others may be saying that. Elkanah is not saying that. But Hannah still feels the despair 
of not having a child. So what does she do? She takes her burden and she presents it to God. She prays and prays and prays. In fact, we can almost look at this as if she's begging God, give me a child. Look at verse 11 in chapter 1. She vowed a vow, that's Hannah, and said, O Lord of hosts, another way of translating that is God Almighty. She's looking to the almighty nature of God, the director of heaven's armies. Everything is under God's control. And she said, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. What is she doing? But she's begging God for a child. Now we fast forward in the story just a few verses and in verse 20 of chapter 1, it says that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel. Now, Samuel in the Hebrew sounds an awful lot like the words put together that means, I was heard by God. What does Hannah do? But she names her son the name that would in memoriam commemorate the fact that God is a hearing God. That's powerful, man. And again, an application from Samuel's life in the first few days, first few moments, as the child is named, we know something about the character of God. In fact, several somethings. That God is almighty, that God is sovereign, that God is powerful in every way, but that also God is near to us as his people and God hears us. That's powerful. And we're going to circle back on that in a little bit. Now, after Samuel is old enough, Hannah does exactly uh, what she promised to do, and she brings the child back to the tabernacle. This is when the tabernacle is located at Shiloh, and Eli is the priest there, and she dedicates the child to the service of the Lord. And so I want to kind of walk through this calling moment, because I think it really encapsulates so well who Samuel will end up to be. So turn to chapter 3. Chapter 3. So much of this is self-explanatory, so I'm just going to read the text to you and perhaps make a couple of comments. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Which, by the way, that's priestly language. So at this point, Samuel, even as a child is ministering in a priestly way. It says, And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. God wasn't showing up. God wasn't speaking to the high priest Eli. God was sort of non-existent, if you will. These are quiet years, if you will. Verse 2. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, that's just a euphemism for he's getting really, really, really old, he couldn't see and he was lying down in his house. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, here I am. Now think about that for just a moment. A young boy, he's laying down in his apartment there in Shiloh, and all of a sudden he hears a loud booming voice, Samuel. And his immediate response is, here I am. How can I serve? Here I am reveals something of Samuel's character. And so verse 5, he ran to Eli. He says, here I am, for you called for me. But he said, I didn't call for you. Go lie down. Go lie down. Go back to sleep. So he went and lied down. Verse 6, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel, verse 7, this is key. (coughs) Now Samuel did not know the Lord, for the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That is, he had not yet heard the voice of God. He did not recognize with any intimacy the sound of his voice. Now we're familiar with this type of idea, right? You get a phone call, even in the days before uh, caller ID, you would pick up the phone call and you would immediately know who it is. And why? Because you recognize the sound of their voice. Samuel didn't have a concept of this yet, but he will. 
He will grow in intimacy. He will grow in stature with God. He will grow in a depth of knowledge of who God is. And when that happens, when God speaks, Samuel understood the voice of God and he would respond to the voice of God. Again, men, a great application from the life and ministry of Samuel. Do you know the intonation of God's voice? That when he speaks, you can respond. Samuel heard from God and therefore would respond. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived, hey, I know it's not me, I know no one else is around, so it must be the voice of the Lord. So he told Samuel, verse 9, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Think about that. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. In other words, God, I am ready to hear from you. Now, here's how I take this. Oftentimes, when I step into a worship service, oftentimes when I step into a Bible study, oftentimes when I sit down in my study and open up the pages of Scripture, I repeat that phrase. Not because Samuel said it, but because it's such a great practice that, God, I'm ready to hear your voice. God, I want my ears to be tuned to the sound of your voice. God, I'm ready to receive what you have for me. There's a submission there. There's an openness there. There's a readiness there. And in a life where everything is going a 1,000 miles an hour, oftentimes a million miles an hour, where we're so distracted and so busy and there's so many things, it's important for us to sit, to be quiet, to be still and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is ready to hear. I firmly believe, men, that if more men in the church would act this way, the church would have a radical character change. That, God, I'm ready to hear from you. Now look down at verse 19. It says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and none of his words fell to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. 4 verse 1, and the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. This is Samuel's calling, his ministry. This is where he steps into where God needs him. Now we're going to fast forward again. I want you to turn over to chapter 7. Eli dies. There's a significant gap, approximately 20 plus years where we're sort of quiet in the life of Samuel. Samuel shows up. Samuel is ministering. And in chapter 7, we see a great summary in many respects of all of the ministry that Samuel is doing. I appreciate this because it's almost like there's an abridgment here. They knew that I was going to, God knew I was going to be teaching this this morning, so he provided the text for us, okay? So look at verse 3. It says, And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the ashtoreth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the ashtoreth, and they served the Lord only. Now what office is Samuel fulfilling here? He's fulfilling the office of prophet. He's preaching to the people. Here's the truth. But he's also fulfilling the office of priest. He's standing in the gap. He's performing the sacred duty. He's leading people away from the worship of false gods and idols and to the worship of the one true God. We see this in the life of Samuel. Let's read on verse 5. Then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned before the Lord and Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. What office is he fulfilling here? Is he pretty easy? It's in the text. He judged the people. He's ruling the people here. He's directing the people to make godly, wise decisions. Again, pulling them away from falsities and pointing them in the way of righteousness, pointing them to the old ways, meaning the righteous ways, the holy pathways, have a relationship with God. Look down at verse 8 through 10. 
And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering there to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. This is the priestly function that Samuel is performing here. This is, he's offering sacrifice for the people of God. He's interceding for them against standing in the gap. The people of Israel are unrighteous, they're unholy, they're they're entrenched in sinful ways, but Samuel is doing everything he can to pull the people back to a godly relationship uh, with God. Look at verse 11 down through verse 17. It says, And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as beth Car. And Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shan and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Here it is, verse 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Again, we see all three offices that Samuel steps into. The ministry of Samuel is strong. In Psalm 99.6, it says that Samuel was as Moses to the people. He steps into that office and leads the people and stands in the gap and is a priest to them, a prophet to them, a preacher to them, a teacher to them. He stands up and fulfills the calling and commission of God in his life. Now, I want to look at some key passages and cherry-pick some things out of his story just to further expand this idea. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verse 6 and 7. Give you a little context here. As I mentioned, there are four offices. The fourth office is the king. Samuel was not the king. During Samuel's ministry and life, God is the supreme king over Israel. As we get to chapter 8, the Israelites say, hey, we need a king. We want a king just like the other nations. We want to be like everybody else. And they are, in many respects, rejecting God as their sovereign king. And they desire a king for themselves who will sit on a physical throne in one of their cities. Now, this seriously hacks Samuel off. He is not happy about this at all. In fact, he takes it very personally. Am I not a good leader? Why are you rejecting me? Okay? And so what does he do? He takes his burden and presents it before God. Verse 6. He says, the thing displeased Samuel. The Hebrew there is strongly displeased. Samuel could not be more upset about this. And he says, rather, uh, Samuel, when he said, give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, check this out, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Here's the the point that I want to make here. Oftentimes as men, when we have an important decision or when something has gone awry in our life or when we just feel like we need a little bit of counsel, we we will throw that up in prayer. Um, emergency prayers, 911 prayers, whatever you want to call it, we'll toss that up to heaven and say, God, God, I need you. I need your counsel. I, 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 need, you, I need you to step into the gap here for me. But I believe what is different from Samuel and a lot of men is that we'll ask for God's counsel, and God may give it, but we don't follow through on the counsel. Is we'll toss something out and say, God, I desperately need your help in this thing, but the, at the end of the day, we're, when he tells us what to do, we sort of turn our back and walk the other direction. We don't want to heed the counsel of God in our life. We may desire it, but oftentimes we don't heed it. Something about Samuel's life is he had such a close relationship to God in prayer. There was such a depth of intimacy there 
that even when God's answer was disappointing, even when God's answer didn't make sense, Samuel followed through on that because he understood that God was the king. He understood that God is the sovereign. He understood that God is the one that is in control. He understood that God is the creator God, and therefore he was going to pursue and he was going to do exactly what God prescribed to him. Man, this is important for us. Not that we would just seek the counsel of God, but that we would heed the counsel of God. Where do you seek the counsel of God? You can seek it in the scriptures. You can seek it in prayer. You can seek it with godly counsel and advice, wise counsel. But when you receive it, you should heed it. Because to turn your back on it becomes sin. Now we're going to fast forward again, look at chapter 12. So God has chosen Saul to be king over the people. And because Samuel is stepping down from his leadership role over the people, he is allowed to give a farewell address. He's stepping down because he's no longer the primary leader. So look at verse 19 of chapter 12. It says, And the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. They realized, after it was too late, Oops, we shouldn't have done this. So Samuel, priest of God, prophet of God, interceder for us, step into the gap and pray for us because we have heaped up this sin. Look down to verse 23. It says, moreover, as for me, Samuel is speaking, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and right way. Here's what I see here. We've already established that Samuel was a man of prayer. He had such a depth of intimacy with God in every way. But Samuel considered it a sin not to pray for those in his charge. Far be it from me, he says, because it is sin. You have been entrusted to me. You have been charged to me, you are under my shepherd's care, and so I am going to do whatever I can to continue to take your concerns, to continue to take your needs before our Heavenly Father, uh, uh, because he's the one that can act on your behalf. Men, my point here is, anyone who is under your care and under your charge, it is your responsibility, charged of God, to constantly be in prayer for them, there is an obligation. Paul says, Romans 15, 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. To bear the obligations of the weak, bear the failings of the weak. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with all. As men, this is where we need to be. The final key passage is in chapter 15. Look at chapter 15 and verse 22. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better than sacrifice and to listen uh, than the fat of rams. So the context here, Samuel is about to arrive uh, to offer a sacrifice for the people. This is the instance where Saul falls out of favor with God. So the Israelites are gathered to go to battle against the Philistines. Uh, as is custom, an offering needs to be offered to God so that God would charge ahead and be the conquering hero for the people of Israel. And so they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and the, and the, and the uh, soldiers are getting antsy, and people are starting to leave, and they're starting to have fear and anxiety among the people. And Saul as well, starting to get very nervous. Where is Samuel? Where's the man of God? Why is he not here? I, I guess I'm going to have to offer the sacrifices myself. This is a checkbox moment for Saul. Let's just offer the sacrifice, get it over with, and let's go to battle. So that's what Saul does. 
He stepped into the gap where he shouldn't be. He offers the sacrifice. And then Samuel shows up. And Samuel says, what have you done? Samuel's point here in verse 22 is, it's not about sacrifice. It's not about checking the box. It's not about ritual. It's not about religion. It's not about going through the motions. It's not about the external, but it's about the internal. God is concerned about the heart. What does God want? God wants your heart because your heart toward him reveals something so much more important. Jesus says this in the Gospels. He says, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Keeping God's commandments is evidence of a love within our heart. Samuel says to the people of God, God wants your heart. So man, again, I apply this to us and I say, don't just go through external actions but seek the purity of the inward being and have it leak through your body as you love God through your action as you obey his commandments. Now I wanna wrap all of this up and apply in just very specific detail before we have a time of discussion, okay? First of all, let's look at the four offices. First of all, king. You're not the king, that's very clear. I'm not the king. We're not called to be the king. As is the story here in 1 Samuel, God is the king. Samuel clearly lived his life in submission to God. Lots and lots of examples. Samuel didn't step into the gap and say, okay, uh, I'm going I'm to appoint this guy king or this guy king or I, my opinion is what's most important. No, he surrendered himself to God and said, even when he was to appoint David as king, he said, David doesn't look like the right guy, God. He's too small. He's too little. He, he's not muscular. He's, he, he, he doesn't match all of the characteristics of what it is to be king. But God said, he's the king. And Samuel said, he's the king. God's the king. We surrender ourselves to God's leadership in our life as men. Second is judge. To be judge is to be leader. And men, we need to be leaders, leaders in our sphere of influence, leaders in your family, leaders in our church, leaders in our workplace, to act like men, to act like Samuel, and to lead. In today's world, I think that in many respects, men are too milquetoast, feeble and timid, unwilling to step up and lead, to be, in, to be leaders as instructed by God. Now listen, I'm not talking about being a tyrant in any way, but to stand up and lead, to defend those in our charge, to, to step up and provide for. This, this applies to the physical sphere, the emotional sphere, the spiritual sphere. We're to step up and lead those that God has entrusted to us, particularly our wives and our children. One writer says it this way, though under attack from all sides, the man as a head, makes decisions for his family, both popular and unpopular, because he loves those affected by his choices. He considers their perspective before steering to the left or steering to the right. He doesn't micromanage, but he does drive from the driver's seat. He leads his children and he leads his queen as he follows Christ. This is the charge that we have. Mature masculinity governs, governs its household well. This is why Paul in 1 Timothy says uh, to Timothy, if you're looking for leaders, look for men who are leading their households well. The church needs more men who are leaders. The church needs more men who are going to stand up and be a representative for God and carry out the charge and commission that God has issued to us. Be a judge. The third one there is prophet. And again, to be a prophet is to speak the truth. And I'm not talking a little T truth, I'm talking big T truth, God's truth. We speak the truth even when truth is hard to hear. We see that in the life of Samuel. And as prophets in our own home, we have the great privilege and responsibility to speak truth 
to our families, to speak truth to our wives, to our children. The reality is that there are far too many wives and far too many children who have never heard their father speak the truth of God over them. The truth of encouragement in God's word, the truth of exhortation in God's word. Men sit back and don't do what I believe God has called them to do. Speak to those that you love the truth of God's word, even when it's not popular. And finally, priest. As priest, Samuel interceded for the people. He stood in the gap and lifted up the nation to God. And as priest in our own home, we have the great privilege and responsibility to intercede for our families, to intercede for those in our workplaces, to intercede for those in our church, to intercede for the leaders of our church. And we could go on and on and on, kneeling in prayer. That influence that we have in heaven, there can be no greater calling. Men, as we look at the life of Samuel, and in the brief session we've had this morning, for me, it's judge, prophet, and priest. How can I, as a man of God, live Samuel's life? I need to do those three things. If I'm going to be a champion, standing in the champion circle at the end of days, I believe that this right here wins trophies. I believe this mentality wins championships. I believe this mentality is what leads my family to be successful and leads them closer in relationship to God. I'm going to encourage you to sit around your tables here this morning and talk about this. Uh, flesh out in more detail what it is to be judge, prophet, and priest. And here in a couple moments, I'll come back and pray.
All right, man, let's grab a knee, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of Bible study this morning and uh, for a life uh, in many, many respects, well, well lived. Father, we see Jesus in Samuel. We see you in Samuel. Uh, we see the Spirit of God in Samuel directing and leading his life. And Father, I pray the same for these men and myself. Uh, Father, that you would direct, that you would guide, that you would lead us. Father, that you'd bless us with your wisdom in all things. Father, we want to be men in the champion circle. Uh, we want to win championships, not in the earthly, worldly sense. But, Father, we want to be well used by you, fulfill the calling and commissioning in our life. Father, I pray that um, for each of these men today, that you would help them to be the men that you've called them to be, as judge, as prophet and priest and their families, in full surrender and full submission to you as king. Father, for the men that have... Uh, problems, burdens that they're bearing this morning, questions in life, and, and uh, um, they're throwing up their hands in disbelief or discouragement in anxiety or fear. Father, I pray that you would meet them at their point of need. Father, let there be another man in their life that would wrap their arms around them and encourage them, and Father, walk with them and give them counsel. Father, I pray that you would anoint us in men for, as men for those moments to bear one another's burdens. Father, as we go out into the marketplace today, as we go out to our families today, uh, Father, I pray that they would see Jesus 